nice this morning? Just so good to get together and to worship Jesus, amen? And there's just nothing like it in this world. And uh, you know, people ask, why do you go to church? Well, I come to church because we have one who has saved us, who is worthy of all of our praises. He's worthy of receiving glory and honor and majesty from our lips. And also, he's worthy of our devotion. And we want to learn about uh, what he, he's designed for us to walk with him in, in this world of ours. And um, this morning, we're going to continue uh, my series in the book of Mark. And uh, today, my message is uh, on Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath. Now, in the New Testament, we see the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus in full blossom. And, you know, it's always good to go into the Gospels like Mark and to see uh, and, and to hear the stories of how he interacted with people. He healed the sick, raised the dead, laid down the groundwork for a new covenant written in his own blood. And Jesus, God in the flesh, he came to show us what God was like in character as a human, and fully God, yet fully man. It seems, however, that amongst the positive things that Jesus did and said, um, there was, in fact, a dark cloud that followed his ministry from place to place. And uh, let me explain. The, the new covenant was given by God to humanity because it was superior to the old covenant. It was time to put the old covenant to rest and to bring in a new covenant of life. People needed a new covenant because the old covenant had thir thoroughly shown that humanity was unable to save themselves from their rebellious nature against God. The disobedience that each of us as human beings have inherited from our forefather Adam. Now sin was ravaging the planet. The old covenant was good, but it exposed something in the nature of people who were captive to sin inside of their spirits. And when Jesus walked the earth, the character of God by some, some people was misrepresented and misunderstood. And the spearhead of this came from, in fact, the religious community, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the old covenant law, they had a problem with Jesus who displayed the pure character of God so much, though, that they didn't recognize him as being sent from God. And they themselves claimed to represent the very God that they were seeing in the flesh, but they didn't realize it. They were obsessed with man-made rules, especially the rules concerning ritual purity where Jesus, in fact, was more concerned with God's love towards a lost race that needed redemption. Now, my message is going to be talking some about the Pharisees today. And um, today, I'd like to talk about Pharisees. Now, it's easy for us to stand back and go, oh, those terrible Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of law, how could they do what they did, did to Jesus? But I want you to understand that the heart is desperately wicked and prone to wander from the living God, and any person can, in fact, be led astray. The Pharisee was, um, was a photograph of the sinner's heart when man tries to work out his own salvation. So we're going to talk about Pharisees, but we're also going to, I'd encourage you to be in prayer as we go through this. Lord, search my heart. See if there be anything in me that needs to be changed. Because the preacher here is not a perfect man. I'm redeemed. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I praise God that I'm saved, and I know where I'm going, but there is danger for me 
and for you to fall into the wrong line of thinking. There's a, there's a danger to it. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. The text this morning is Mark chapter 2, 23 to Mark chapter 3, verse 6. Mark chapter 2, we'll start by reading verses 23 to 28. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered, Have you, ever, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave to some, some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. You see, in those days, although what the Hebrews referred to as the Torah or the written law of Moses within the first five books of the Old Testament specifically prohibited working on the Sabbath day, which was designated as God as a day of rest. The religious leaders interpreted the parameters of what it meant through what they called the oral Torah, breaking down the specific activities that were prohibited. So the oral Torah, or the oral law of the rabbis, represents laws, statutes, and legal interpretations of the law of Moses that were not recorded in the first five books of the Bible. But nonetheless, they were regarded by Orthodox Jews as guidelines for living and were considered law. The oral Torah is the Jewish code of conduct that encompasses a wide swath of rituals, rules, um, practices, God God, man, and interpersonal relationships, from dietary laws to Sabbath and festival observances to marital relationship guidelines to agricultural practices to laws governing civil claims and damages and all that kind of stuff, how to sort things out. Very, very specific. And according to Jewish tradition, the oral Torah was passed down orally from generation to generation until its contents were finally committed to writing. And the contents of the oral Torah can be observed today in what is referred to as the Mishnah. And the Mishnah was, was, uh, was put into writing. Before that, it was just oral tradition passed on. The Mishnah was put into writing in 200 AD. So within the oral Torah... There were 39 categories of forbidden activities on how to observe the Sabbath. 39. There were specific activities that were forbidden for Jews to, to, to do on the Sabbath. Many rabbinical scholars point that these regulations of labor have something in common. And they prohibit any activity that is creative, that, are, that exercises control or dominion over one's earthly environment. So the oral law of the Torah in, in, G, in Jesus' day clearly taught that it was unlawful to winnow on the Sabbath. Winnowing is one of the 39 forbidden activities that you can't do on the Sabbath, and it usually exclusively refers to the separation of chaff from grain. So when the disciples were picking the heads of grain and rolling it in their hands, and eating the kernels of grain, they were in fact winnowing the grain, which is one of the 39 oral traditions that were passed down from the rabbis that's, that were unlawful on the Sabbath. Didn't matter if they were hungry or not. It was something they said, you shall not do. See, this incident that we read about here in the New Testament here, in Mark, illustrates the conflict that Jesus had between the traditions of Judaism that were in place and the liberty of the gospel that Jesus was bringing forth. And we see after Jesus Christ's crucifixion and resurrection from the dead that the law of love and of grace came in. Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses and established this new covenant. 
So when Jesus answered this passage that he was Lord over the Sabbath, Jesus was proclaiming to the world and especially to these legalistic Pharisees that he was greater than the law and above the laws of the Mosaic covenant because God in the flesh is the author of those laws. Most certainly then, Jesus, being the author of those laws, was able to properly interpret the laws that he had originally written through Moses to properly interpret them. And he put his finger on something. He says, you guys in your oral traditions, you're wrong. This is not what God intended. His oral Torah, Jesus' oral Torah, unlike the oral Torah traditions of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, um, we're more able to interpret the law of Moses on how God originally intended it to be followed. In fact, what the disciples were doing was not violating any law of God. Man was created first, and then God appointed a Sabbath day of rest for his well-being. Unable to keep the law, however, the Pharisees had instituted this complex and confusing system of oral Sabbath laws of their own making, and it was oppressive on the people and legalistic and impossible for people to carry out perfectly. In essence, what, what happened was these religious leaders had placed themselves above God and made themselves Lord of the Sabbath, lording it over the people, placing this impossible burden on the shoulders of humanity to carry, and Jesus stood up against this brutal misrepresentation of God's pure, holy Sabbath law. Now, Jesus used King David as an example here, right? We just read about it. Ordinarily, the bread in the tabernacle was forbidden to be eaten by anyone but the priest, yet David and his men, under the circumstances of being chased down by Saul, they went and asked for the bread because they were starving. They were hungry, really hungry. And they were not condemned by God for doing so. Things were not right in Israel when this occurred. Although David had been anointed as king, he was running for his life as Saul pursued him and they needed food to survive. And David wasn't being irreverent and disrespectful of the Lord's law. When he did this, he went to the Lord in his time of need and the Lord had mercy on him through the priest. Like David, Jesus although anointed as king, was not presently reigning as king. In fact, the king's men had to pick grain as they traveled in order to survive. And this showed that things when Jesus walked the earth were not right in Israel. The Pharisees, you know, they criticized Jesus' disciples as lawbreakers as they ate gleanings from the grain fields. Yet his disciples had broken no law and they didn't offer a stitch of food to these men who were hungry. They just criticized them. And Jesus reminded the Pharisees that the Sabbath law was given for God by God for the benefit of humanity, not for bondage. Jesus was making a statement that most certainly God's intention on prohibiting work on the Sabbath day was never intended to prohibit works of necessity or deeds of mercy. The intention was to set a day aside where God's people could be free from their secular employments and activities of work in order to rest and to worship God on that day was made for man because it was good for that rest. To honor God who created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. And to further emphasize the thoughts on this, immediately after telling this story about Jesus, view on the Sabbath, John Mark, the writer of the book of Mark, tells another story to emphasize what the Lord's thought of the legalism of the Pharisees. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, reads this. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. So, rather than looking at Jesus with awe and wonder at the fact that when he spoke, people were getting miraculously healed, these 
Pharisees, in their heart, were accusing Christ. Rather than having compassion on the poor man who was suffering with the crippled hand, the Pharisees were more concerned with their own self-righteous political positioning and being right than they were about this poor guy with this broken hand. They cared more for their own agenda than for the soul and the physical well-being of this man that God created. And to God, this is a grievous sin. It's a grievous evil. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, said to the man stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. And his hand was completely restored. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. They'd already gotten rid of John the Baptist. Now they wanted to get rid of the Lord. The only thing that we see in the gospel writings in the New Testament that got Jesus truly angry was when people who claimed to represent God in the name of God acted in ways that would deeply impact people and turn them away from a relationship with God. God still gets angry when he sees religious people that should be focusing their attention on his mission, and yet they have become so focused on their own thing, their own meetings, their own needs, at the exclusion of the needs of the lost and the perishing that are stumbling around in the darkness around them. This is why Jesus overturned the money tables in the temple when he was there. The religious leaders were more concerned about maintaining the temple system and their own comfort and the power they had. They are more concerned with that than the, than the well-being of the Gentiles. The Gentiles' place of prayer was being desecrated in the temple by the religious leaders for the sake of the, 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 the leadership's selling of sacrifices in a convenient place, and the profit that they made from these religious ceremonies. This made Jesus, God in the flesh, angry. That's what made Jesus angry, was these religious leaders that misrepresented God and what was important to God. The same anger of God over this injustice is written by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, 12 to 17, we read, When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts, your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourself and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Powerful words through the prophet Isaiah that apply to the scenario in the temple and apply to the scene in which Jesus found himself in the synagogue and apply to us today when we look upon the world as believers. Jesus knew the hearts of these Pharisees and how they are more concerned with maintaining the status quo of their thoughts, their traditions, and feelings on an issue. They were more concerned with those things than they were about the man who stood before them suffering. The circumstances showed how wicked their hearts had drifted and become and how distant they were inside from the heartbeat of the living God. They couldn't do anything to help this man, and they actually resented those who could or would even dare to try. 
Their hearts were so hardened, they didn't even recognize God when he was standing right in front of them. They thought that it was wrong for Jesus to perform a healing miracle that helped this poor man on the Sabbath because it interfered with the way they interpreted things and how they should be done. Yet somehow, at the same time, it wasn't wrong for these Pharisees. I suppose after the synagogue service was over and they were gathering around their lunch tables to plan for Jesus' destruction on the same day. The nature of human sin is evident in the Pharisees. It's so evident. They were more concerned with being right, so much more concerned with being right and having their pride intact than they were about doing what was right before God, before the people that they were supposed to be ministering to. It's always the same with the religious spirit. Always the same. Lest we think that we're exempt from falling captive to this religious spirit, we must understand that each one of us has a heart that if left to itself is desperately wicked and prone to wander from the living God, even though we are saved and we've been given a new a nature, there's still this wrestle between the old and the new. There's an old nature that likes to rise up, and if we give him room, he's going to rise. Each one of us has the capacity to drift into the mindset of the Pharisee if we are not careful. How do we recognize the spirit of the Pharisee when it knocks at our door to tempt us to do wrong? I propose that the spirit rises up and may be recognized when human religious systems are under threat of change and the religious spirit cares more about being right about an issue than it does about attitudes and actions that will negatively impact our relationship with other people who are needing a healing touch from Jesus just like this man in the synagogue needed to be touched by the Lord and healed. The religious spirit cares more about self-preservation and the comfort of human traditions than it does about soul winning and about the loss that are pouring into the pit of hell. We must be on guard, my friends, against this attitude. It is very, a very present danger for every single believer in Matthew 16, 6, Jesus warned his disciples, he warns them to ensure that they do not follow this legalistic way of thinking that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had been entrapped in. He said, be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because like yeast spreads through a loaf, so the, the attitude of the Pharisees and the Sadducees spreads throughout the, the, the body of Christ if not put in check. Oh God, have mercy upon us sinners that have been redeemed. God, have mercy on us to be wary and careful and to step in such a way that is pleasing to him instead of into the role of this, this religious spirit. As followers of Jesus, man, I know. I find it hard to keep myself from having an attitude. Maybe you do too. When you're confronted by things that don't seem right, that Get into your craw. It's easy for us to drift away from the intention that God has for us to, to look at things the way that he looks at them and to look at things through the eyes of the old man, through our flesh. I want to be right. I want to be, mm, it, it's all about me. Oh, God have mercy on us. The truth is that Jesus wants to touch people out there through you. You are his messenger. You're his disciple. He loves you very dearly. And he, he wants you to walk and step with him and to see the people around you that need the gospel, that need a touch from Jesus. I like how it speaks to this issue in the New King James Version where Paul says to Timothy, he says to Timothy this, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. See, all of us are at risk at catching the spiritual cancer of self-focus. All of us. Not one of us is exempt from this. That self-focus turns our spirit sour, gravitating towards a form of godliness which has no power in it. 
A form of godliness which places a greater emphasis on nitpicking issues which matter very much to us but matter very little in the light of eternity at the expense of effectively reaching to people and touching them with the gospel of Christ. Even seasoned pastors fall into this trap. I remember a case when I was a young man and I was running a drop-in center. And a very well-intentioned pastor came up to me. We just finished seeing 15 kids come to Christ. And what we had, had in that community, there wasn't a community hall for the kids to hang in, so we opened the basement of the church, and we had the church open, and all these people from outside, non-Christian people were donating stuff, ping-pong tables and televisions and even pool tables, donating it to the local church so that we could place this open for the children so they'd have something to do. The youth would come in and they'd play ping pong and they'd play pool and they'd play foosball and we had Christian videos playing and we had music playing that was contemporary to them but had a Christian message. And kids were, we were having Bible studies and kids were getting saved. This guy, this man came up to me. He, he just became the new pastor, brand new pastor in the church, came up to me and he says, so what are you doing here? And I said, well, we're reaching out to the children in the community. There's like 70 kids. 70 kids in a town of 1,500 people coming out every Friday night listening to the gospel. You know what he did? Shut it down. You know why he shut it down? Because there was a pool table involved. Because those kids shouldn't be listening to contemporary Christian music. They should be listening to bluegrass and be watching puppet shows upstairs. He told me I was a messenger sent from Satan to discourage him. And I had to back away, and I watched that, that thing crumble. The kids recoiled. It, it, was, it self-imploded. It, dis, it was destroyed, and that church actually ended up shutting down. Oh, God have mercy. There was no need for that. We had, we had the gospel going forward to these children. We had these, had these times, and they were unchristian. Like, they were non-Christian kids that were coming to Christ. And we were able to share the gospel with them. They didn't like the cafeteria because we were selling chocolate bars for money and pop for money. Well, that covered our expenses. We weren't charging exorbitant amounts. It covered our expenses. Stuff like this, people, we've got to be on guard against it. When we yield to such temptations to impose our thinking about what is spiritual and what is not, we can strain out the gnat and wind up swallowing the camel. The fallout of such decisions can be harmful our t- to our testimony as a local church and can serious, have serious roadblocks that keep people from hearing and accepting the truth of the gospel. God, forgive us. Our flesh so easily forgets that the central reason that Jesus came was not to give us an experience to grab a hold on so that we could have it easy and enjoy our lives here. The reason Jesus came was to save us from ourselves and our selfish ambitions. It was to take our hearts of stone and replace them with hearts of flesh that were in line with the Holy Spirit's idea. It was to set our heart in motion with the things that are important to God. And what's important to God? What's important to Him? How we do something? No, it's not that. What's important is that we bring Jesus' hope to the despondent, healing to the broken, to see captives set free, and ultimately seek the Lord and be saved from an eternity away from Him. That's what's important, and everything we do here needs to be about our Master's mission. Absolutely everything. We learn for the sake of not just learning, we learn for the sake of preparation so that we can effectively be a lighthouse in a dark world that doesn't know the right hand from their left. Generally, I suspect that our failures to effectively engage in evangelism and missions are not motivated by intentional malice on our part, but they're generally deeply rooted in self-centeredness that we possess as long as our attitudes abide at the helm. It leads us to overlook what is really important and trumps the fact that others, people 
Others need to come to know Jesus. And you may be, I may be the only Jesus that these people see because the Spirit of Christ lives in us. When they look at us, what do they see? That is a question for every Christian. What do they see? Do they see someone that loves them, that genuinely wants to see them come to, come to good? Or do they see us as self-centered and wanting only what's best for us, regardless of the cost everyone else around them? We need to ask ourselves these tough questions because these are the tough questions that make a difference on how the local church succeeds or fails in evangelism out there. It's a grievous evil that we have the capacity within our own hearts to behave like the Pharisees. They, they didn't even see. There's this guy, and Jesus is going to heal him. They didn't even see that this man was suffering and needed to be healed. All they could see was, this is an opportunity for us to nail Jesus. This is an opportunity for us to push our own feelings on what the Messiah should look like, our own feelings on what we should believe, our own feelings about our traditions and how we should operate things. It's our time right now to rise up and that Jesus is getting in the way. So we need to get rid of him. Oh. Pharisees displayed an insanely selfish behavior. Sometimes we, we can, as a, as a Christian culture, we can put up a church building and attend regularly thinking that somehow people will just see the Christian activity that's going on here and they'll visit our programming out of their own initiative. Yeah, there, there's some times that that happens. Yeah, Awana is a great example of that. And that's, that's okay. But we must be careful because if our actions show people that we believe that our comfort and our rights to have everything just so, the way that we like it, are more important than engaging with the brokenness of the world around us, we are in a world of trouble. Because they're going to look at that and they're going to go, if that's what your Christianity is, I want nothing to do with you or anything to do with anything that you're doing. See you later, Charlie. And I don't know about you, but I've heard an awful lot of that lately. And it's grieving to the heart of the Spirit of God. It's grieving. I know this is a hard message, folks. And I, know I don't mean to come down hard. I just think it's really important that we look at things for the reality of what they are. Because Jesus is calling us to be salt and light in this world. He's calling you to be an ambassador for him where you live. If we're the only ambassadors of Jesus that the round, people around about us see, are we showing them something that makes them see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Or are we turning them away? See, because if we're turning them away, that's the spirit of religion that the Pharisees had embraced. That sin, just like the Pharisees, grieves the Lord and makes him actually angry. Each one of us have the opportunity to live in obedience or disobedience. Hey, man, I'm pointing all ten of my fingers here. This, I wrestled with this message. I wrestled with my Lord. Is there some of this in me? And you know what? I, I have to admit, I recognize some of the Pharisee in me sometimes. I think all of us probably do. Humility and spirit has become unpopular in many Christian circles, and it's time to repent it's time to acknowledge our need before God to be renewed in our love for him and in, in the love for others around us. God, forgive us for the sin when we fall into it and wake us up to see that Jesus wants us to live 
a life that is other-centered, not self-centered. May we heed the warnings of Jesus to be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees at the exclusion of ministering to the needs of the broken. Let us pray.